So, on behalf of the organizer, very warm welcome to all the participants <coughs> and Professor Leon and Rochier to the afternoon session of this workshop. So, we request all the online participants to store the questions in the question answer box or they can ask the question at the end of the session and unmute, unmute and ask the question. So, we are honored to have Professor Leon and Rochier with us today. It's a privilege and great pleasure to introduce him. Professor Leonan Roshier is a leading expert in control of PD. Currently, he is a professor at the Laboratory de Mathematics Pure and Apple, Joseph Livele, University de Litoral, Cote de Opale. His research areas are partial differential equations, control theory, special emphasis on controllability and stabilization of dispersive PD, fluid mechanics, inverse problems, and numerical analysis. He has pub publication in prestigious journals and he has been awarded several research grants. He has obtained outstanding results on control of KDV, which has immense influence in the study of uh, critical length, which is mentioned by Professor John Michel Coron in the direction of the KDV. And his research direction on the control of KDV equation, for example, his works on exact boundary controllability for the KDV on bounded domain in 1997. I encourage students and young researchers to go through his excellent books and the lecture notes including that the Lyapunov function and stability in control theory and the survey of controllability and stabilization result for partial differential equation and uh, control and stabilization result for KDV equation is recent progress and more recently the controllability of some evolution equation by flatness approach with Philip Martin and Pierre Rocho. So these notes and are freely available in the web and I also request the student to you may have a look on the mini course which is available in the YouTube on control of dispersive equations by Professor Leonan Rashke. Today in this workshop, he will introduce and discuss his recent work regarding the flatness approach for control of PD. I hope you will enjoy the lecture series and Professor Leonan Rashke, it's over to you now. Okay, thank you very much for this very kind introduction and also for your kind invitation. It's a pleasure for me to, to do this course. Unfortunately, I cannot um, I cannot be with you because I have to teach uh, in Calais. I have three courses to teach now. So it's very complicated for me to, uh, to leave Calais because I have uh, also some uh, teaching duty to do. So uh, as it was said, so I will uh, propose you uh, the today and the, the next day uh, uh, some uh, course about the flatness approach for the control of PDFs. And actually, um, I will talk of uh, some uh, joint work with many people. So I will present my collaborators for this course. So uh, Antoine Benoit, um, who is at the same place as me, that is the Université du Littoral Côte d'Opale in Calais, in France. This is a colleague. My student, uh, my PhD student, uh, Romain Loyer. Uh, uh, who defended his thesis uh, in December. Uh, also, uh, Mrs. Mo Chen uh, from the Northeast Normal University in Changchun in China. Uh, Camille Laurent from Sorbonne University in Paris in France. Uh, Philippe Martin from Mean Paris Tech in Paris and his colleague uh, Pierre Rouchon from Mean Paris Tech in Paris. And uh, Ivan Rivas from Universidad del Valle in Cali, in Colombia. So uh, my course is uh, outlined as follows. So I will first uh, talk about the flatness approach for ODEs, uh, uh, which is a theory developed by uh, many people in the 90s. So I will give you some slides about that, even if I didn't contribute to the flatness of the ODEs. So this is just as some introduction. So this is the first part. In the second part, we will have a look at the flatness approach for the control of PDEs. So we will start with the null controllability of the heat equation in dimension one. So I will try to explain in a few lines how it works and, and uh, what are the ideas uh, below this kind of approach. Uh, next, we will pass to the null controllability of the heat equation on cylinders. I think I will stop today uh, at, uh, after this part. Uh, next, uh, new controllability of the 1D Schrodinger equation. 
and uh, next we'll pa uh, pass to the controllability of parabolic equation with coefficients that are not uh, necessarily smooth. And we will start with weakly degenerate parabolic equation. So this is a joint work with uh, Philippe Martin and Pierre Rouchon. And next, a uh, more recent result about the uh, new controllability of strongly degenerate parabolic equation. And it is a joint work with uh, uh, Romain Loyer and Antoine Benoit. So th this will be, I, I, uh, I think, the program of tomorrow. Uh, the third part is concerned with the reachable states. Uh, uh, so we we'll start with the boundary control of the heat equation in dimension one. So we will see what sort of result we can obtain by the flatness approach. But I will also uh, uh, provide you the, the, the sharp result obtained uh, recently by other people. Uh, next, we will pass to the distributed control of the heat equation for which uh, our approach can give something. Uh, we will see that the flatness approach can be also applied for the linear court of the risk equation. And finally, uh, this approach can be applied as well to the sakharov kuznetsov equation in dimension two or three. And the last part of this call, this uh, course is concerned with the exact controllability of nonlinear PDEs. So we will see that we can also attack the problem of the controllability, the exact controllability, not the new controllability of uh, some nonlinear PDEs. So we will start with the uh, exact controllability of semi-linear heat equation by using uh, our approach. And next, we will consider the controllability of anisotropic Wendy equation. So very general uh, PDEs that could be not well posed uh, uh, when you look consider the Cauchy problem. So let us start with the flatness approach. What is the flatness approach? Okay, let us have a look at that. So first a slide. Uh, so what is the controllability problem? Uh, what is the issue? So you start with some ODE, dx over dt equal f of xu. Uh, like the ODEs that you have in a automatic control. And so uh, F in general is not linear. X is a state. So we are in finite dimension. So X will be in Rn. And U is an input okay, that you can choose as you want. U is uh, assumed to be in Rm. So we consider this kind of ODEs and we say that it is exactly controllable in time t if uh, for any x0 and xt, you can find a function u of t, so so-called the control input, such that the solution of this ODE with the initial data x0 equal x0 uh, satisfies at, at time capital T, x of capital T, x, xt. Okay? So any pair of states, x0, xt, can be uh, steered by a trajectory of your system uh, corresponding to a good choice of the control input. Uh, this is the definition of the exact controllability. It turns out uh, for linear systems, this issue is completely uh, understood. So you know uh, if you can do it or not. Uh, but now for a uh, nonlinear system, it's quite uh, quite complicated actually. And there are still uh, uh, open issue in that uh, in that uh, context. And of course, you, I refer you to the uh, nice... Uh, talk given by Karin Bouchard about this kind of problems. So what is the flatness? So, okay, so uh, given this ODE, which could be not linear, well, there exists, as I say to you, a good result, some positive results, some negative results, uh, which tell you uh, if you can indeed uh, obtain the exact controllability of your system, okay? So you can answer to that issue if it is possible or not to uh, construct a trajectory from any initial data to any terminal data. But in general, these results are theoretic and it's not easy uh, to, uh, to construct in practice a trajectory from uh, X0 to XT. These results do not give you the, the way to, to, to construct the, uh, the input, okay? Okay, so, but there are some systems, the so-called uh, flat system for which you can actually easily 
construct the input. Uh, and what is a flat system? So roughly the flatness approach consists in a parameterization of the trajectory by, by some uh, output, some part of the uh, trajectory actually has uh, some, in general, it is a part of the coordinates. Uh, and we call this output a flat output. Huh? So with this flat output, you are able to uh, construct um, the trajectory in addition to the control. And this notion was introduced in 1995 by Michel Fliss, Jean Levin, Philippe Martin, and Pierre Rouchon for linear or uh, non-linear ODEs. And it turns now that it is, is a very popular uh, technique because uh, uh, it has numerous uh, application in engineering because it's a way to construct uh, easily the trajectory uh, which drives your system from uh, X0 to XT. Uh, so it can be used in practice. So it's good for that. Okay. So what is the, the idea behind? So you consider so a small control system x dot equal f of x of u, where x is the state in Rn and u is the uh, input in Rm. And in addition to this system, uh, you assume that you have some output y, which will be also in Rm, and this y depends on x and u and uh, also of a finite number of derivative of u. So I mean that y uh, will be written this way. It will be some function h that can be not linear. Actually, it, it, it does not, uh, we don't assume that h is linear. And this function depends on x, u, u dot, and possibly t uh, derivative of u. Okay, we will say that uh, y is a flat output if, uh, you are able, by using uh, algebraic uh, computations, uh, to express x and u as function of y and its derivative. Okay, so from this, from this equation, from this equation, uh, you assume we assume that you are able to express in some algebraic way. Huh? So just by doing computations, a basic computation. So you can express x as a function g of y, y dot, and the derivative up to order p. And the control u as a function of y, y dot, and the derivative up to the order uh, q. Huh? And p and q are non-negative integers. We don't have any bound about them. They can be uh, any uh, integers. And g and h, these two functions, are smooth functions that they can be uh, non-linear. Okay. And of course, uh, in addition to these two relations, you, you want that if x and u satisfy this relation, you want that the dynamics to be satisfied. Okay, you, you want to be able to go back to from this equation uh, one, two, and one, three to one, one. Okay, so in practice, what do you do? So you, you start from one, one, you choose a good output uh, y. Uh, such that, okay, you can express x and u in terms of y and derivatives, but in addition, you are to be able to go back. So, so your computation are to be reversible so that if you have this expression, the, uh, you, you have to be sure that the dynamics is satisfied, okay? Okay. And if it is the case, but you will say that y is a flat output. And you will see that if you have a flat output, so the, the control problem is very easy to solve uh, in practice, okay? So now assume that you want to solve the control problem. So we have the ODE, x dot equal f of x u. Uh, the initial condition, x at zero is x naught and x at capital T is xt, okay? So you want to solve this control problem by, by uh, designing a good control input u. 
Okay, so for the ODE, now you can to forget about it because if X and U are given, are defined by um, the output this way, you know, as I say to you, that the ODE is satisfied, okay? Okay, so the, the ODE 1.4 uh, is satisfied. So now the only issue is to see we, if you are able to satisfy the initial data x0 is x0 and xt is xt, okay? And so you express it in terms of the flat output. So actually you replace x and um, x by its, its expression in terms of uh, the, the, the function y. So you know that x of zero is g of y, y dot y to the p at zero. Huh? And you obtain, so uh, you, your, um, uh, your condition to, to be satisfied is that this expression is uh, the initial data x0. This is for the initial data. And for the terminal condition, you want that x at, ca at time capital T, which is given this way, it has to be x of t. So now you just have actually condition at time t equals 0 and at time capital T for y. And these two conditions are in general very easy to satisfy because so it's just uh, some interpolation problem. Uh, so when you have uh, no derivative, so just some uh, Lagrange uh, interpolation problem, when you have one derivative is Hermit interpolation problem, okay, but you, you can do it at any order. So actually in, in general, you can design some function which is polynomial, some Y which is polynomial to satisfy these two conditions, okay? So this is a program. I, I will not give you any theorem about that because it's not uh, the goal of this course. It's just to give some idea how it works, okay? I, so I don't provide any theorem, but I will provide some example. So we, we will try to see how it works on example. And it would be nice if you understand uh, so the idea for this very simple exa uh, example. So let us start with a double integrator, which is one of the most important example of uh, ODEs. So in automatic control, because so this is the so-called linearized pendulum, and it 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 it, it, um, it occurs in many situations. Okay, so this is just the very simple linear system. X one dot is X two, and X two dot is U. Okay, so you control uh, uh, the derivative of the second uh, coordinate. Okay, and the first coordinate is uh, linked to the second coordinate by this equation. Okay. So you have a state in R2, x1, x2 is in R2, and the control input is in R. Okay, so this is a linear control system, and it is classical to see that it is controllable. You can use Kalman wrong condition to, to, to see that. But now our issue is to, 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 to find explicit control uh, to drive the system from one position to another one, okay? So we will pick uh, y equal x1. So we have to design a, a flat output, okay? So let us start with y equal x1. Let us, and let us check that everything works well with this uh, very simple output in dimension one. So I claim that it is a flat output. So I have to prove that I can recover x1, x2, and u uh, as function of y and its derivative, okay? Well, but this is trivial huh? because so x1, y is x1, so x1 is y, so I can recover x1. x2 is x1 dot, so x2 will be y dot, okay? And finally, u is actually x1 dot dot, so u is y dot dot, okay? So I can indeed express x1, x2, and u in terms of y and its derivative. And at the same time, uh, when you have this set, uh, this equation that are that are satisfied, it's very trivial to see that the system here is also satisfied because actually our computation are reversible. Okay, so your uh, your system, your ODE is satisfied. So now we have indeed the flat output. So now, uh, if you want to steer the system from zero zero to one zero in time capital T, what do we have to do? We have to pick. Uh, the, uh, the the function y as a same infinity function of the of the time t such that so uh, let us have a look at the condition so uh, x one at zero should be zero so it means that y at zero should be zero 
next x2 at time 0 should be 0. That is, uh, y dot at 0 should be 0. So these are the initial condition. And uh, at the final time, uh, x1 at time capital P should be 1. That is, y at time capital T should be 1. And finally, uh, x2 uh, at time capital T should be 0. That is, y dot at time capital T should be 0. So these are the conditions that we have to impose to Y to uh, solve our control problem. Well, now this is very easy. You, you are just for uh, a condition. So uh, uh, you just can see that this very simple uh, polynomial function works well. So it's convenient. Uh, this function, okay, uh, satisfies all these conditions at zero and at time capital T. And it's a trivial exercise. Of course, you, you can make it more... Uh, um, theoretical by using Hermit polynomial, but just okay. But by doing a trivial computation, you find it immediately. So this is a very simple example uh, where everything was linear. Okay. So another example. Consider now a nonlinear system. Huh? Uh, so x one dot equal u uh, one, x two dots equal u two and x3 dots equal x1, x2, u1. So this system now is not linear, okay? So uh, the state is x1, x2, x3. Uh, it is in dimension 3. And the control is u1, u2 in dimension 2. Okay, so how to find the flat output for this system? So the idea actually is to eliminate u1 by uh, using the first and the, the last equation. So you make the ratio and you obtain that x2 by uh, doing the ratio, x2 is x3 dot divided by x1 dot, okay? Uh, when you, you use these two equations, you, you make, you compute the fraction and you obtain this. x2 is x3 dot divided by x1 dot. But so it means that uh, you can uh, find x2 if you know x1 and x3. Huh? So x2 is, is an expression of x1 and x3, and they are derivative. So uh, although you can express u1 in terms of x1, and actually a derivative of x1, and u2 will be a derivative of x2. So I mean it will be a derivative of this, of this guy, OK? So OK, so it's very uh, Tempting to take as a control uh, as a flat output y equal y1 y2 equal x1 x3. So let us check that we can indeed uh, uh, express all the states and the control in terms of y. Uh, so uh, so x1 of course of course is uh, y1 because of the definition of y1. x3 is y2 by the definition of y2. And uh, as we obtained uh, before from our very trivial computation, x2 is just is uh, x3 dot by divided by x1 dot. That is, it is y2 dot divided by 1, 1 dot. OK? So we have expressed x1, x2, x3 in terms of y1, y2, and their derivative. OK? And for the control, u1 is the derivative of x1, so it will be y1 dot. And for u2, so you, you have to, uh, u2 is x2 dot, so you have to take the derivative of this guy. But when you okay, compute the derivative, you, of course, you obtain this expression, and this expression is still a function, nonlinear function of y1, y2, and their derivative. Okay? So, X means that, okay, we can express the state X and the control U in terms of Y and their derivative. And again, our computations are reversible. So from this, it's very easy to see that if you have this expression, if you have this equality, you can go back to the system. And so your ODEs will be satisfied. Okay. Okay. But now if you look at this expression, you have one Y1 dot in the denominator. And so it could happen. What, what happens when this guy uh, vanishes? You can have some problem because you will divide by zero. And uh, unfortunately, uh, this situation can indeed occur because y1 is uh, x1, OK? And so if x1 at zero is the same as x1 at time capital T, 
by the Rawls theorem, uh, you know that uh, x1, the derivative of x1, has to vanish somewhere. Uh, you cannot avoid it. And so this guy, y1 dot, can vanish somewhere. And okay, it's a concern, but so you have to fix it. And a way to fix it is to also impose that at the same time, y2 dot vanishes. And it has to vanish us at at least the same order as y1 dot. Okay. And so this is the idea. So if you choose for y1 and y2 analytic functions, uh, you will have to impose that the derivative of y2 uh, vanishes at the same order, at least at the same order as the derivative of y1, so that this guy will be actually a smooth function. And well, of course, uh, and you can it it has it, it a sense at any time, and the same will uh, it will be the same for its derivative as well. So let us complete this example. So let us pick, uh, for instance, x zero is zero zero zero, and x t as target uh, state zero zero one. And as I said to you, okay. Uh, x1 at 0 is uh, x1 at time capital T. So if we have a candidate y1, y2, uh, it, it, uh, y1 has to vanish, us, to, to vanish at some time uh, bar t, OK, necessarily. So well, how to manage it? So recall, so I recall to, to, to see what are the conditions to impose. Recall that x1 is y1, x3 is y2, and x2 is the is y2 dot divided by one one y1 dot. Okay. So to satisfy these two uh, uh, conditions at time zero and at time capital T, we have to impose this set of conditions. So let us review them. So x1 has to be zero at time zero and at time capital T. So y y1 at zero is zero and y1 at time capital T is zero, okay? So this is a condition for the first coordinate x1. Um, second coordinate, uh, so, no, uh, let us have a look at x3. x3 is zero at time capital zero, so it means that y2 is zero at time capital zero, and x3 is one at time capital T, so y2 at time capital T is one, okay? These are the conditions for uh, x3. Now x2. So uh, x2 is 0 at time 0, but x2 is y2 dot divided by y1 dot. So we will impose that the numerator is 0, y2 dot at 0 is 0, and we will impose that the denominator is not 0. y1 dot at 0 is different from 0. So this is the condition for x2 at 0 is 0. So now uh, x2 at time capital T is 0, so we will impose that y2 dot at time capital T is 0. But uh, the, the uh, y one dot at time capital T is different from zero. Uh, the same, okay, okay. And now, so we say that at some time bar t it will be bad. So actually, we will say that okay, the, the bad time will be t over two. So we impose that y one dot at time capital T over two is zero, and for the over time it will be different from zero. Okay, so y1 is uh, the derivative is, uh, is zero at, at time capital T over two, but not at the over time. So for instance, you can take for y1 this uh, very simple uh, polynomial function uh, and you have a parabola, okay? So the derivative actually uh, vanishes only at time capital T over two. So you have this condition and this condition. And uh, we assume as though that the, con the second derivative at time capital T over two is different from zero, so it is the case here. Huh? Uh, so that uh, y1 vanishes at the first order, okay? So now you just have to impose that y2 vanishes at the first order as well, at time capital T over two, okay? So you just have to impose this condition, okay? At time capital T over two. And now you can, have all these conditions satisfied by using uh, these two polynomial functions. So for y1, it's just a parabola. For y2, okay, you have to look at all these conditions. Well, it's quite easy to do, but you, you compute a com uh, primitive of some good uh, polynomial function. And okay, you can obtain after some computation this simple expression. Okay, so uh, you were able to, to solve your control problem explicitly, and you can design this way uh, your control input.
So this is this was the flatness explained a few slides for ODEs. And now let us have a look at the flatness of PDEs. So uh, what are the control problems uh, for PDEs? So, uh, so we consider, for instance, some uh, open set omega in R n, which is uh, smooth bounded. And uh, let us consider a part of the boundary, which is a non-empty open set of the boundary called uh, gamma. And so, okay, in general, we have this kind of system to solve. So you have the PDEs where, where P is some polynomial function and D is this operator where you have a derivative in time and all the derivative in space from X1 to Xn. So it is quite general uh, PDEs, okay? And uh, you have with that a boundary condition. So that I um, split in two parts. So you have, a boundary condition for which you have some control at the boundary, and you can as well have boundary condition for which you don't have any control. Okay, for instance, for some PDs of order four, you should have two boundary condition at the boundary. Okay, so you can split the boundary condition this way, and finally you have uh, some terminal, uh, some initial condition. Okay, and actually uh, we have to add maybe also derivative in time okay, in general case. Okay, so we'll say that our system is exactly controllable in some space H in time T is if uh, um, for any uh, set, any pair of uh, states uh, Z0 and Z1 in H, one, one can pick a control input U in some space that I will not give. So just the solution of our system satisfies that at time capital T, you, you are at uh, Z1, okay? So you start from Z, uh, Z0 and you arrive at Z1 in time capital T. And if you have this property only for Z1 equals Z0, uh, you say that your system is null controllable. Okay? So this is the definition of exact controllability and null controllability. Let us have a look, for instance, at, at the famous heat equation. So this is the equation for theta, the, the linear heat equation, and I have added in blue some possible nonlinear terms. Okay, and we consider here uh, some uh, Dirichlet uh, boundary uh, control, which is applied on the part of the boundary, and this is the initial condition. So it was uh, proved in a beautiful uh, paper by uh, Gilles Lebeau and Luc Robiano in 1995 that uh, the linear heat equation um, is null controllable for any time t and any open control region uh, gamma. Okay, And any also uh, open uh, bounded control uh, uh, domain uh, omega. Okay, So you have the null controllability without any assumption about gamma and omega. And also it was proved at the, at the same time by uh, Korsikov and Imanovilov in 1996, uh, that the above system is null controllable even if you had some reasonable nonlinear uh, uh, term in your equation. You can also have nonlinearities. Okay, we can manage them. And to obtain this uh, beautiful result, uh, Korsikov and Imanovilov introduce a so called parabolic Kalman estimate. And you have a course about this Kalman estimate done. Uh, by uh, Sylvain Arvedoza. And uh, okay, this estimate uh, takes uh, the following form. So it's a sort of energy estimates in which you have a weight huh? and the rate, which is quite complicated because you have a double exponential, the rate vanishes at time t equals zero and at time capital T, okay? And thanks to that, actually, in your estimate, you don't uh, have to pay attention to the initial data or to, to, to the terminal data, okay? thanks to the fact that the, the weight vanishes at zero and at time capital T. So you can control V uh, and derivative of V in terms of the operator and in terms of some uh, boundary observation expressed in this integral. But okay, you, you have to uh, choose a convenient way to do that. Okay, and this is a parabolic Kalman estimate. So thanks to that, you can obtain the observability inequality and the null controllability of your equation. Okay, so here we will see how to make it 
for uh, the Neumann boundary condition and for the linear equation, which is actually the maybe the the more physically relevant for application because what you control for the equation is not the temperature but actually the flux. Uh, so we consider uh, uh, Neumann uh, control uh, expression three and to simplify, okay, the expression is there is no uh, nonlinear term and so just a linear equation and okay, so we want to uh, to revisit uh, the new controllability uh, problem for the heat equation with the Neumann boundary condition. And we went to okay to uh, arrive at um, theta equals zero at time capital T by the, by uh, designing a good control input. Okay, this is what we want to to uh, to consider by using the flatness approach. Okay, even if I said to you that this problem was solved uh, in full generality by uh, 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 Le Beau Robiano and Forsikov and Rilov in dimension n. Okay. But here we want to have some uh, explicit uh, control designed thanks to the flatness approach. So to attack this problem, actually, you have uh, two, two sets of methods. And this is the way I see the things. So you have this, what I call the duality methods. Uh, I mean, you have to write the joint equation and you have to prove observability estimates for the joint equations. Okay. So this uh, kind of uh, problem was investigated uh, in dimension one by uh, uh, Fattorini Russell in a, a very famous paper in 1971, but also uh, by Luxembourg and Corvear in, at the same time, even if these people are less known in control theory, but the, the, the result is the same, and also by Dolecki in 1973. So they, they were able to prove so the observability inequality and to prove that you have the null controllability, null controllability of the heat equation, even with variable coefficient in dimension one. And so he used um, by orthogonal families and actually behind all of this, you have complex analysis. Okay, so you, you need to, to, to work with complex analysis to prove all these things. But it works mainly only in dimension one. Or you have a partial result uh, for very simple geometry in dimension two and three, but it, okay, the main application of these techniques is the dimension one. And to solve the, the problem in dimension n for any uh, any geometry, so any uh, omega, any uh, um, uh, control region, any capital, any time capital T, so uh, you have to use something else. And so you can make it by using karma estimate. So it was done, as I said to you, by Le Robiano and Imanovilov Fursikov at the same time. Um, so these are the, the so called duality methods, but you can also use direct methods, so for which you don't go back to the, you don't consider the joint equation. You, in, you attack directly the, the, the problem. So uh, it was done by Jones and Littmann. In uh, Jones in 1977, and uh, Littmann by 19, 1978, and by doing a construction of a fundamental solution of the heat equation with compact support in time. And you have a compact support in time, it's possible to do that actually, and it's a very beautiful result by Jones. So you, so you can construct a fundamental solution of the heat equation with a compact support in time. And with that, you just make convolution with your initial data and at time capital T, you arrive at zero. The drawback of this thing is that, okay, you have to control on the wall boundary of uh, omega. Well, so this is a limitation. In dimension one, okay, by using symmetry, you can control only in one point, not in the two uh, endpoint, but in dimension n, it's difficult to see uh, if you can how to, to restrict to any uh, control region. Also, uh, a direct method was also used by uh, Gu and Littmann in 1995. And for, to, to attack the problem, they consider il pose problem. Uh, that is a Cauchy problem in X, not in time, in X. Okay, so these are il pose problem. And they were able to uh, obtain uh, the null controllability of sublinear heat equation in dimension one this way. And actually, we will go back to this approach later on because what we will do is, in some sense, related to this kind of approach. Okay, 
And finally, uh, it was also considered by Laroche, Martin, and Rouchon in 2000. And uh, actually, they used the flatness approach, but they didn't obtain at this time uh, the null controllability. What they obtain is some approximate controllability or the null controllability, but with prepare initial data, not for any initial data, but for some very good initial data. And so, uh, What we try to do is to uh, improve the result of Laroche, Martin, Rouchon by uh, removing the assumption that the initial data are prepared. And so uh, we will obtain this way the null controllability for any data in L2. And we show that it, okay, it can be used as well for, the, for numerics. So uh, in the following slide, I, I, I will uh, mainly present uh, uh, some results in the joint work with uh, Philippe Martin. Uh, And Pierre Rouchon uh, published in uh, Automatica in 2014. Uh, so, uh, the flatness approach um, uh, introduced by uh, Laroche, Martin, and Rouchon for PDEs actually was used to uh, obtain the approximate controllability of the heat equation, but as well the beam equation and the linearized KDV equation. So, it's not limited to a parabolic equation, actually. And they prove that prepared initial data can be driven to zero by using a control input that are Gevray. Uh, so let us have a look at uh, the Gevray function. So I will introduce some uh, basic things about that. So I will refer you to the beautiful uh, book by Rudin, Real and Complex Analysis. And I will talk about a quasi analytic class of uh, function. So assume that you are uh, given a sequence of positive real number M0, M1, M2, such that M0 is 1, and Mn, Mn squared is less than Mn minus 1, Mn plus 1 for all n. Bon, I assume that you have this kind of thing. I will give you some example after. We say, we introduce a class of functions that are synthetically smooth on R, uh, such that there exists some positive constant C and R, depending on F, such that the uh, derivative of order n of f in the l infinity norm is less than c times n n divided by r to the n, where m of n is uh, uh, okay, uh, one of the number of the sequence. Okay? So we assume that you have this bound for the derivative of order n uh, for the function f. And this is a class of functions that you consider. So first result anyway, that you can see in the book of Rudin, Each class CMN is an algebra with respect to pointwise multiplication. I mean, if you have two functions f and g in this class, the product is also in this class. Next, um, a class CMN is said to be quasi analytic if uh, when you have a function in this class and if all the derivatives of order n uh, are zero for any n. At, at some point zero, uh, this, all this condition implies that f is a trivial function, f equals zero, okay? And some, uh, it's similar to some analytic function. So for analytic function, if all the derivatives vanish at some, well, at some point, for instance, zero, you know that the, the function is zero. But so we call a class quasi-analytic if you have the same kind of property. And Just from the definitions, it's easy to see that uh, a class C, M, N is quasi analytic if and only if the only function in the class with a compact support is a trivial one. Okay, non other result is the Danjoy, uh, Danjois, sorry, Karlman theorem, which tells you that, okay, if you have uh, a sequence M0, M1, M2, and so on, satisfying this, uh, this uh, estimate. Huh? then the class is not quasi-analytic if and only if the series of m n minus 1 divided by m n is convergent. Okay, so this is a necessary and sufficient condition. So you can see on the progression of the, the coefficient m n if your class is quasi-analytic or not. And so applying this uh, beautiful result to uh, this kind of uh, estimate. So we will call after this function Gevray function. So the derivative of Fn is, some, is less than some constant c times factorial n to the s divided by r to the n. Uh, so 
this correspond to mn equal factorial n to the s and we can see that uh, this kind of uh, sequence fn satisfies this uh, condition it's very easy it's a trivial exercise then we can apply the result and if s is less than one uh, if you compute this uh, fraction you will find actually uh, um, one over uh, n to the s okay and so if s is less than one but the series of course is not convergent and so this thing is this series is uh, takes the value infinity so it means that the, the class is quasi analytic but it's not surprising because when s is one it corresponds to analytic function so it means that when s is less than one f cannot be a non-trivial function with a compact support it's not possible but if s is less is larger than one the class now is not quasi analytic you apply still the the, the result because the series of one over n to the s in the now is convergent when, when s is larger than what so it means that you can find a non-trivial function with a compact support so you can have a cutoff function in this class uh okay and then we will use it later on so now let us consider a Gevray function so a function uh, y which is say uh, of class uh, which is symphony smooth is said to be Gevray if you have this kind of estimate so it means that you are in the class um, in this class okay with mn equal factorial n to the s okay so uh, the larger s the less regular y is so what s equal one correspond to a function which is uh, analytic and when s is uh, less than one the function turns actually to be complex analytic on c and actually you you you, uh, you have a connection with the order of growth of the function and uh, at the same time so we can have uh regularity which is different which depends on the variable and so if you have this kind of estimate we'll say that uh, theta is of order s1 in uh, x uh, and s2 in t if, if you, so when you take derivative in x um, of y you obtain p1 factorial to the power s1 okay so you, you have the regularity s1 in x and the same 40. so as a, re, a consequence of the danjoa carleman of no of the, the theory i explained to you before uh, the set of Gevray function of order less of order s larger than zero is an algebra for the multiplication of functions so the product of two functions of Gevray of order s is also Gevray of order s and as i said to you uh, you can find a function Gevray of order s larger than one with a compact support this is okay a consequence of a donjoa kalman result but actually you can find it explicitly a very simple function like this so this function which is uh, one if t is less than zero and zero if t is larger than one and with this expression between zero and one so by direct computation you can prove that this is the vrai of order s equal one plus uh, r to the minus one so with s which is larger than one okay actually you can obtain any s this way and it is a step function so it, uh, for negative uh, t it is uh, one and for very positive and large t you, it is zero so it's, it's just a step function and of course with this kind of function with two step function you can construct in very easy way a function with a compact support but you have something which is completely explicit well I, I will skip this thing just to tell you that actually you have a connection between the Gevray regularity and the order of growth of the function well it is uh, I, I will skip this slide because I, I, I would like to explain something else um, so let us have a look at uh, uh, La Roche Martin Rouchon result uh, so you, you consider so this control problem when you control the Neumann data at x equal one so this is your control at zero you have no control and what uh, Laroche Martin and Rochon prove is that if you start from initial data theta zero that you can expand um, as a power series this way and you assume that y one does not grow too fast so that okay this the series will converge and actually it will converge well. Uh, so if you have this grow for y1, 
uh, then you can uh, find some u which drives your state to zero uh, in time capital T, and your u will be a function of rare order s, where s is the number that you have in uh, this group. Okay, so let us try to to see how it works. Um, so what is the flat output that uh, you will take? So you will take y of t is uh, the Dirichlet data at zero. So let us back to the system. So at zero, uh, you have uh, some homogeneous Neumann uh, um, condition, okay? So theta x at x equals zero is zero, and the control will be at x equal one, okay? But so you take the Dirichlet data for which you don't know anything, okay? And you take it as, as the output. So y of t is theta of t zero. And we will say, we will see actually that uh, it is flat in the sense that you are able to recover um, the trajectory theta from uh, the knowledge of y. Okay, so we have a bijection between theta and y. Okay, so let us have a look at that. Let us have a look at that. So you, you seek a candidate solution. So it's formal computation for the moment. And then it, so you, a solution a theta of t and x that you write as a parallel series. Okay, so you actually, you just assume that you have something which is analytic in x. Okay, so it can be written this way. And for this, you use the coefficient ai, could depend on t and you don't know them, okay? So you plug this uh, formal uh, solution into the heat equation. So when you, uh, you compute the derivative in time, you obtain ai prime, when the prime is a derivative in time, and when you compute the two derivative in x, okay, you, you have some shift in the index and you obtain I, ai plus two, okay? So you have that this series should be zero, uh, and necessarily, if this uh, power series is zero, the coefficient has to be zero. So the, the, the term into the two brackets should be zero. So you arrive to this induction formula, a i plus two is a i prime, okay? Now, now you have to look at the first coefficient, a zero and a one. A zero of t is uh, theta of t zero. If you go back at this, and if you do x equals zero, uh, you obtain this thing, and this thing is just the, the output, is y of t, okay? And a y of t uh, should be zero because, okay, uh, you have this condition, okay? The, the, the Neumann boundary condition at x equals zero should be zero, okay? Okay, and so when you plug uh, in, in this uh, induction uh, relation, you obtain that all the old, uh, uh, the, the coefficient a two high plus one should be zero, because this thing is zero and you have this, this condition. And for uh, the uh, index, uh, which is even, you have A too high is a derivative of order I of Y, okay? So formally, you obtain that theta should be given by this expression, uh, by this series, it's a, Taylor, it's a power series, in which you have all the derivative of Y. Okay, so you can express the trajectory theta in terms of the derivative of y. And in, actually, you can as well uh, compute um, the control. u is theta x at t1. So you just do x equal 1, and you take derivative in x, and you obtain this expression. But now the problem is, okay, this is a formal computation, uh, how to, to be sure that this series is converging, okay? So what you have to do is to find a function uh, y, which is infinitely smooth, because you have to compute uh, infinitely many uh, derivative of y, such that the above series, this series is converge, it converges. Huh? And at the same time, uh, as for the, the flat uh, approach in, uh, in, for ODDs, you have the set of condition at time zero and at time capital T. So at time zero, you have to, uh, um, you have to, the, the, the derivative of order i of y has, has to be uh, y y, huh? because uh, you you have this equation, huh? you have this, okay? Okay, so, and at time capital T, it has to be zero. And of course, if y is analytic, it's impossible. Huh? You cannot get any uh, reasonable uh, analytic function that satisfies all these conditions at time capital T if y 
i is different from zero. Okay, but if y is the vrai of order s, well, this thing is possible. You can have a non-trivial function, and we will see actually it's possible with a function which is the vrai of order s. And okay, what you have to see now is okay, we we can do. Uh, the Bohr computation, we can justify itself carefully when y is the Jevre function of order s. And this is what I will call the flatness property. In some sense, okay, we will solve uh, some ill posed problem in the Jevre class. So we take uh, some s which is between 0 and 2, and the function which is symphony smooth y. And uh, we assume that it is the vrai of order s on uh, the interval t1, t2, and we introduce this function, okay? The function that we have obtained by uh, formal computation. So they, uh, we claim that actually this function is the vrai of order s in t, so the, the same the vrai regularity as y, and of order s over 2 in x on, uh, on this domain, and it solves your Cauchy problem in X that I call uh, some uh, impose problem. So uh, this is so you still have the heat equation, and uh, you have you prescribe the Dirichlet boundary condition at X equals zero, and as well the Neumann boundary condition, which is zero here. Okay, so it it uh, it is a solution of this problem actually. By Holmgren series, then there will not be uh, any other solution. That's the only solution of this problem. And so if you have that, uh, you can, so you, you can design, so the, the control input just by uh, derivating formally this guy in X at X equal one, and you obtain this thing. And this thing as though is the vrai of order S. So your control input will be the vrai of order S on T1, T2. Please, how many minutes do I have now? Three? Five minutes. Uh, bon. I, I will try to explain so the, this proposition. Actually, it is the core. I think it's the core of the flatness approach for PDEs. So you need to prove the flatness approach. So I will try to explain it to you uh, with a few minutes I have. And uh, on tomorrow, okay, we will continue with the controllability problem. So how to prove this flatness approach? So this is the only technical part, actually, I think, in, in this approach. Uh, so you, we compute formally the derivative of theta with respect to t, t and x, and we obtain, uh, of course, this formal series. Okay, and we have to prove that this formal series is uh, uniformly convergent on the domain, so that if it is the case, you apply classical result uh, in calculus, and and with this result, you you know that okay, the derivative of theta is indeed given by the series. Okay. So we need to prove the convergence, and as well, we need to prove uh, estimate like this, and we need these estimates to, to, to say that theta is a vrai of order s in t and s over 2 in n, in uh, x, okay? So how to make it? So you, you look at this term, and okay, we have to bind it. So I will try to explain you the, 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 the step to obtain the result. So. For this thing, what you do, so you just uh, say that y is the vrai of order s. So you can replace this thing by this estimate. So this thing divided by this guy. Uh, this is the definition of the fact that y is the vrai of order s. Uh, and now what you do for that, so you use this estimate, and uh, which uh, comes actually from the binomial formula of Newton. Uh, you can estimate all the, all the binomial coefficient by this power, it's very classical. And so this thing is estimated this way, okay? So next step, so um, uh, we use actually Stirling formula and by using Stirling formula, you can obtain some equivalence of two i factorial in terms of i factorial to the square. So you have this kind of formula coming from Stirling formula. So you plug it in this uh, numerator to estimate this guy to the S. And so you obtain this thing coming from that. Okay. Uh, so this guy comes here. 
uh, and for this, so the two to the power one plus m, you you plug it in this coefficient, you change the change the, the coefficient r, but it's not very important. So you have this estimate, and again you use this estimate uh, for two i. So you you place y plus j by two i, and so you can estimate this in terms of the factorial of two i minus n and n factorial. And so you obtain this estimate. Okay. So at this moment, okay, you, you have this thing that is good. And the dependence in I is just given this way. So of course, it's clear that the series uh, of this guy in I is convergent because of uh, two I minus N as the denominator. So this series is convergent. Okay. So this guy will be indeed convergent and, and actually uniformly convergent. Okay. So we prove this way that it is infinitely smooth, as it was the first uh, goal. And now it remains to have estimate. So you, have, you need to have estimate of the sum over i of this guy, and you have to see what is the dependence in n. Okay, and this is what I do here. So we make the sum of this guy. So so the, just the, the trick is to do a change of uh, variable. You you set g is uh, uh, j is 2i minus n, and you replace uh, in this guy. And uh, by doing the change of variable, you obtain uh, this series. Okay. And so this guy is convergent, of course. And uh, so depend it's bounded by a constant times this guy. Uh, uh, and now, th so this guy is, is not very important compared to this guy. Okay. So you just change the constant r1 into r2 this way and so you can uh, match you can bind all these guys by this thing okay so this way uh, you were able to bind the derivative of theta in x and in t this way and this is exactly the, the okay the, the, the proof that the, the function is Jevray of order s in t and s over 2 in x as the, as we wanted okay so this a very small proof of the flatness property. And okay, I think I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Leonon Roshia, for the nice talk. So now I ask the audience if they have a questions, or also the online participants, if they have a question, they can unmute and ask Professor Leonon Roshia. So I have a question that here, when you have done these uh, estimates, if the e uh, equation, like here we are doing for a heat equation. So if the equation T and X derivative are of same order, like transport equation, 1D, is this method will be, we can use this method? Good question. For for the transport equation or for hyperbolic equation uh, to date, uh, we, we didn't um, use the flattened approach actually. Um, uh, so I, I mean, we we did we didn't have result to that uh, with exact contributive result. Okay, but it turns that Fleece and collaborators obtain approximative uh, contributive result for uh, hyperbolic equation in two thousand something like that. But it's approximate uh, uh, controllability. Huh? So. I mean, at the level of exact contrariety for the for the time being, we don't have result. What we expect actually is that we could obtain result by uh, lowering some delay, some time delay in in the time of the controllability. So the time of, of controllability, of course, has to be large in house, but uh, it, it still has to be written. Actually, I, I think I, it should work. Uh, we, I think we can obtain probably some result about that, but it's still to be to be done. It has to be done. Okay, so that means that in an equation, if you are uh, the like here, the heat equation case theta t and theta x x. So the t the number of the order of the derivative of t, if it is equal to the order of the derivative of x, still in this situation it can be done, right? What you are saying? It, it uh, 
it's not available. It's difficult to to to, to talk about a result which is not uh, uh, which is not written. I, I think I think some some result should be obtained. I, 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 this is my. Um, it's not a hope. I think it is a guess. Okay, I guess that some result should exist at the price that you have to assume that time is large enough. Okay, but it has to be written. Uh, uh, it has to be written. It's not done. So wave equation also no result up till now, right? Yes. But uh, if you are more than relative in space as in time, uh, you have a general result. And I will talk about that at the end of the course, actually. Uh, where you have, you have more than relative in space and in time, actually, uh, you have definitely a result, and actually even for uh, nonlinear PDEs. So the, 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 the method works for, uh, even for nonlinear PDEs. But in the hyperbolic case, for the moment, uh, well, I, we didn't do the computation, so I cannot tell you exactly what we obtain uh, because it's still to be to be done. Okay. Thank you. So there is a online, there is a question. Is this method give us an estimate of the null control cost of the heat equation? Uh, this method, uh, actually everything is explicit. So you, you, can, uh, you, you can compute L2 norm of your control because you know the control. It, it is also uh, still to be done actually. So uh, I, I don't know, uh, up to my knowledge, I, I don't know if somebody tried to make it. it. I think it could be done, but uh, I didn't try to make it. But everything is explicit, you, okay, so you can do the computation, I think. My guess is that actually it should not be so, so bad because actually when you have a solution of the heat equation, natural solution of the heat equation, it is it has the regularity that uh, we impose here. So it should be a Jevre of a, a order, say, one, one half in a, inside a zero and one and a, of order one in T. And so the regularity we impose actually is a natural regularity inside the domain. So my guess is that probably there is no loss uh, in the in, in the cost of the control, but it, it still has to be uh, car carefully written. It has to be done. Yes. Okay. So if there is no other question, let us thank Professor Leonan Rashi again. Thank you. So. We'll join again tomorrow in the same time. Okay, thank you. Yes, see you.